half I'm going to pay to everybody I've cheated. And so everything I've done, everything I've built to this point is now gone. We need to find Jesus when we're sinners and realize the response to being a sinner is repentance. If we don't admit our sin, then we give excuses. Isn't that how it always goes? We bargain, we pretend, well, I needed it for this. I needed it for that. You know, we didn't have enough to be able to get by. That 10% thing, man, that's crazy. Who would ever do something like that? That can't be. That's, that's not in the New Testament, certainly not. Well, how much do you want to give? When he starts giving, I think it's probably all gone by the time he gets done. You see, we can do the bargaining and pretending and excuse making, but the response to our sin is repentance. That's really what it's all about. The response of repentance is the, the way we get past our sin and to the arms of a loving Father who calls us home. Jesus' teaching, he says, Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. What does he mean by that? What re- those who people who go around crying all the time? Well, no, certainly not. Was Zacchaeus crying? No, it doesn't appear that he was crying at all. It doesn't appear that he was sorrowful. It's just a matter of, here's my statement about my life. Is it repentance? Yes, it is. Do you have to cry in order to get repentance? Well, a lot of times it does happen, but I don't know that it has to be there every single time in order for that to happen. But as you look at all of this, you realize the reason for mourning would be our sin. I mean, you can't, it's hard to mourn over your blessings and say, God, you just didn't give me enough. I should have more. That guy's got more. I should be like him. I want more like him. No, that's really not what it's about. It's, we need to be able to know that what we did was wrong. And that it's not going to happen anymore. That's what repentance is. It's the turning around and saying, this is never going to happen for me again. And I don't know that we see that a lot today. Because we don't really see it as wrong anymore. You see, once you've done it so many times... It kind of doesn't feel wrong anymore, does it? It kind of feels like it might be okay. I mean, everybody's got sin, and this one's mine, and so mine's okay. Well, it's not okay. I know it's not okay, because if I don't want anybody to see it, I don't want to be Zach, like Zacchaeus and everybody know it, but oh, uh, I'll just say, well, you know, it's really not that bad. I know people a lot worse than me. Isn't that our justification because we don't see it as killing us as it putting us out of the whole realm of God of us putting us out of society in fact we may be doing it in order to fit in with society because they're all doing it we need that it's what makes us part of everybody else it's what makes us accepted I mean, we can drink like they drink, and we can cuss like they cuss, and so we're able to do all kinds of stuff that they do so that we'll be accepted, so that we'll be like them. We don't want to be like Zacchaeus, rejected by our own people. When you mourn over your sin, that's what it needs to be. Don't mourn over getting caught, but I think that may be what happens more than anything else. The only time I mourn is when I got caught at it. So if I got caught at it, well, yeah, I'm real sorry then because I'm sorry I got caught. But I think maybe today there needs to be some mourning over the fact that we do sin. Not mourning over the penalty of sin because a lot of times it has a penalty. A lot of times it separates you from other people but we've been willing to pay that price all this time so and we're not willing to pay that anymore. It's different than finding Jesus in my financial need. We just need Jesus to provide. But when I find Jesus, 
here in my sin. It's different from healing. I need healing. I I need him to do something for me. It's different than suffering. It's different than failure. It's different than every other place where you would find Jesus. And yes, we're going to look at all of those. But you need to get this one. You need to get this one where you find Jesus in your sin. Why is it different? Well, repentance is really the response, but it's a sorrow over sin, but it's just full honesty at this point. It's realizing this is who I am, this is the mistakes that I've made, and I am no longer willing to make those. And some people just want to skip this part. I never admit our need. Oh, I'll admit my need, but I never admit my sin. I need lots of things, God. He says, but what about your sin? If Jesus would just fill my need, then I'd be okay. And that's what we really want. So we pray more about our need than we ever do about our sin, don't we? Because we don't want to face that. He said, you're blessed when you mourn over your sin. We finally find comfort. We finally find release. We finally find a way to get rid of all those things. It's still hard not to stop. You still are going to struggle with it. It's still going to be very, very difficult. But there's no guilt anymore. There's no hiding anymore. Because it doesn't matter if people know because it's gone. I'm, I'm not that person anymore. And be sure and give yourself that kind of forgiveness so that, no, it's released, it's gone, it's forgiven because repentance has taken place and certainly the forgiveness of God has been able to come in and take over my life and now I am able to be free of that. We struggle with this so much, I think. Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 14 is a really hard passage for me. Because of what it says. And he just gets right in the middle of your denial of this sin and right in the middle of all of my excuses and he just doesn't leave me much wiggle room or way out of this. He says, strive for peace with everyone and for the holiness without which no one will see the Lord. See to it that no one fails to obtain the grace of God and that no root of bitterness springs up and causes trouble and by it many become defiled, that no one is sexually immoral or unholy like Esau, who sold his birthright for a single meal. For you know that afterward, when he desired to inherit the blessing, he was rejected, for he found no chance to repent, though he sought it with tears. That has got to be some of the saddest words in the Bible. With no chance to repent. Can you get there? Where there's no chance to repent? I mean, we've always been told, no, you can, you can get forgiveness anytime. Anytime you want to come to Jesus, he's always there. He will always be there. He will always forgive you. So what's the problem? The problem is you may get to a point where you can't. No, I'll always be able to. I'll always be able to say the words. Not talking about saying the words. Talking about finding real repentance. Esau got to that place. You know the story of Jacob and Esau. They're two brothers. They fought their whole life. They fought before they even were born. If you can imagine that. And the story goes about, you know, Jacob is the the gentler one who has the flocks and Esau has the farm and goes hunting a lot and dad likes Esau and mom likes Jacob. And one day he's coming in and there is this great stew that Jacob has made and he feels like he's about to starve to death. And he goes, well, because Jacob is sneaky. Give me your birthright. Birthright. What good's a birthright if I'm dead? I mean, after all, I'm going to die here. I'm going to starve to death on the spot. No, just give me your birthright. I'll give you the bowl. 
okay, done. Because our reasoning, our excuse says, you know, if I die anyway, what good's a birthright? So he'll get it then anyway, so I might as well trade it to him. Do you realize what's in that bowl? In that bowl is the history of the world. In that bowl is the fate of all mankind. In that bowl is the blessing that would come upon every person to make them available to be able to enter into heaven. And it would come through his family. It would be directly through him. And he has the right to it. He owns it. He's the oldest. And the oldest always had the birthright. It means he gets two-thirds of dad's money rather than the little one-third that his brother would get. And he says, all right, I'll sell it to you. I'll sell my birthright. And all of history changes. The sad part is it seems to be set up and that God knew this beforehand. And so the passage that we're looking at in Hebrews When you look at this passage, well, okay. When you look at this passage, there's no root of bitterness. Make sure that doesn't happen. And no one becomes defiled. And then verse 16, the whole phrase together, that no one is sexually immoral or unholy like Esau. Well, those things seem kind of different, don't they? Sexual immorality or selling your birthright. Those, those are kind of, aren't those completely different? I mean, we don't even have birthrights anymore. Uh, it doesn't really happen that way. It doesn't give you the whole family inheritance or anything like that. But he puts those things together. To me, it looks like no sexual immorality or unholy like Esau who sold his birthright. So what's it trying to say? I think what he's trying to say that he took something precious and he treated it like it was inconsequential. Like it really didn't matter. And I think that's what we do a lot of times with sexual immorality. We take something that is so precious that is God-given that should be reserved for only one person in our life and we treat it as if it's just for fun. As if it doesn't really matter as if it's just a, a one-night stand, a one-night thing. It doesn't matter. It's, it, it, everybody does that, right? It's the society that we live in anymore. And so it's not a big deal because our culture says it's not a big deal. And so you can move in. You can live with whoever you want to live with, and certainly that would imply that all the sexual things go with that, right? I mean, you know that once you move in, Because that's what's going to happen. And you're taking something that is precious and treating it as if it's ordinary. As if it doesn't matter. That's the one thing you have that is just you, that is so personal, that is so intimate, that is only you. And you decide, no, it doesn't matter. Anybody can have it. Who cares? And it's a gift of God. And you seal yourself off and you decide, I don't care about precious things. I don't care what God's given to me. And we treat it like it's cheap. Like it's just a bowl of soup. It's just an action, right? It's just a bowl of soup. That bowl of soup changes the world. That bowl of soup is everything. The Messiah is in that. Grace is in that. Holiness is in that. And he says, I don't care. I'll take the bowl of soup 
over the salvation of God, over the blessing of family. So later on, years later, when it comes time for the blessing, Dad, I'm ready to get my two-thirds of the money. You know the story about how Dad is deceived because, you know, Jacob finds the way to do it and Mom's in on the deal and sure enough, he steals the blessing as well. And he should because he sold the birthright. And once you've got the birthright, well, I don't know how you'd get the blessing. And it says he sought it with tears because he wanted it. It's all the money there. But you cannot go back and undo what you sold. You cannot ever go back. And even though he wanted it, He's hardened to repentance. It's like the guy who can come to church and hear the hardest sermon ever and it just bounces off. It doesn't matter. God's not really talking to me. It doesn't mean anything. So it isn't just the tears. He sought it with tears, right? He wanted it. I'll cry for it if that makes it more like repentance. It doesn't. It's not just the tears. It's about the mourning over your sin. And the repentance says, I'm going to turn away from it. And that's what Jesus is all about. He makes us a way to turn away from it so that now we can go back to the holiness of God. It doesn't give you the place again. It's like the prodigal son. It never gave him back more inheritance. He got no more money for it. Esau gets no more money for it. And you're going to see this history all the way from then until now. It's why there are wars. Because of a bowl of soup. It's exactly why there's fighting and why people die over there. It was from a bowl of soup and somebody who couldn't say no. Romans chapter 5. In verse 6, it says, For while we were still weak, at the right time Christ died for the ungodly. For one will scarcely die for a righteous person, though perhaps for a good person one will dare even to die. But God shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Therefore, since therefore we have now been justified by his blood, much more shall we be saved by him from the wrath of God. For if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more now that we are reconciled, shall we be saved by his life. Much more than that, we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received the reconciliation. That's got to be one of the best passages in the Bible, doesn't it? Because it says Jesus died for the ungodly. He died for us while we were sinners. And so while we were still sinners, he made a way for that reconciliation to take place with God. And and no, you don't get back all the things that you gave away, but you get back your own salvation. Jesus is able to say, today salvation comes to this house. And all of those things can be done away with. And yeah, you might be a little bit scarred from all the things that you've put yourself through. Because you don't get to go back again, but you do get to be forgiven. And you do get to be blessed, and you do get to have glory, and you do get to have this great love of God that has been poured out through Jesus Christ as he made us reconciled. We were still sinners. He met us in our sin. Are you embarrassed? about your sin was Zacchaeus embarrassed I don't know he's up in a tree how would you feel I might be embarrassed you know I want to hide in the branches pick one that's got really thick foliage and I can peek out and I can see Jesus but not so many people can see me yeah that's probably just me are you embarrassed when you go to the doctor's office I mean, you're the only one in the room naked. 
and the doctor and all the other people around have got clothes on. Are you embarrassed at that? Not a bit, because they see it every day. And you are not any different than anybody else. I know we think we're different, but we are not. And so there's no reason to be embarrassed because you need to be healed. You need to get over the sickness. You need to show them the spot. And so you got to say, it's not a big deal. I got to deal with the problem. Here's where we are. Every time you wake up from surgery, you notice you're naked. You're like, how many people were in that room? Did they see me? They all saw you. Okay? And everybody sees your sin. Don't be embarrassed by it. Jesus is not there to embarrass people. And yet I think that's where we get to today as well. I can never come forward because I'd be embarrassed. Really? You you give it all away for that? The fact that you think we don't know that you're hiding in that tree so well because you're trying to see Jesus and you can't get out of the tree. Don't be embarrassed because all of us have been there. Don't be afraid of Jesus because of sin. He has been there all the time. It's where he is at the right time when we were powerless. Christ died for ungodly, embarrassed people like us. It's what he came to do. It's the whole purpose. And Jesus meets a thief on a cross. Two of them actually. One confesses Jesus. He says, I'm guilty in front of all the people And the court's already decided. He says, I'm guilty. And the other guy's saying, well, Jesus, why don't you save us? Why don't you save us? Get us down if you're really the son of God. And the one man is hanging naked on a cross and not embarrassed by any of that. He's more embarrassed by the fact that I'm hanging next to the son of God. And I know what I did and he knows what I did. And I have nowhere to hide on this tree. There are no branches. The other one is abusive, and he demands release. Sometimes it is not release that we need. We have to deal with our sin. He isn't crying. He isn't mourning Well, he isn't crying. I think he is mourning. All he can do is say, think about me when you come in your kingdom because I know who you are. I know you're the son of God. And in Romans 6, Paul writes, what should we say then or do we to continue in sin that grace may abound? By no means. How can we who died to sin still live in it? Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ, Jesus, were baptized into his death? We were buried, therefore, with him by baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, so we too might walk in newness of life. So do we continue in sin to get more grace, thinking it's all hidden? It's not. You're not going to get better. It's not going to go away. The only way to deal with it is, he says, we've got to die to that too. Jesus already died for it. The only one holding up the whole process is us. When we die to our own sin, then we are buried with him, buried in baptism. It's water. We're not going to use dirt. It's much easier this way. You know, you don't have to worry about a shovel hitting you. It is water, but it's a burial of a dead person who says, I am not going to live like that anymore. I am not going to be that person. And it brings us into contact with the blood of Christ. It makes a covenant with God himself that we are now fulfilling the promise of God that he brought through Abraham that we might receive his resurrection. 
We're baptized into Christ. And that's the place where we meet him in our sin. And he gives us his righteousness. Because meeting him in your sin is the first step to a new life. I don't know if you can get to repentance today. I don't know if you can get to the place where you say, you know what, I'm tired of this. And I'm tired of thinking I'm embarrassed. And I'm tired of thinking that people don't know because they're people too. There's not a single person here who doesn't need this. You can do it in your pew. You can do it when you get home or you can come here and have us pray for you. Would you come while we stand and sing?